warm welcome to another edition of To The Point. India's education system in the past has been plagued by a number of problems like the huge dropout rate, shortage of teachers, incompetent curriculum. And to address all these issues, the draft National Education Policy 2019 is on the anvil for the first time since 1986. And the man who has designed the architecture of this policy is none other but the Satellite Man of India and former Israel Chief, Professor K. Kasturi Rangan. I welcome you on the program. Thank you, Neelu. My first question to you, sir, is that uh, from being a Satellite Man to delving deep into the social science of, of something related to education, is it a totally new experience for you? No, I, th I think there has been a succession of experiences that I wonder when. Uh, initially, building satellites was a very focused job. Then when you became chairman, you started looking at the applications a little more carefully and there were quite a bit of social sciences in uh, using the space uh, for the grassroots development. Then went to the, uh, the uh, Raj uh, Rajya Sabha where I had the privilege of learning so many things about this country, something which I would have never got exposed. And that includes a substantial social science component. But the most important aspect of this exercise, which was assigned to the team here, in which I just said, is the fact that, uh, in a sense, it was a mother of all the complexities okay. that I experienced. Because I think it was a very, very challenging demand. If you go through this 484-page uh, draft, uh, the biggest limelight, or so to say, the, the portion or the section which became controversial was paragraph 5.4.9 and that was the three language formula which, which uh, people spoke about. Now, I just want to know, I don't want to uh, go deep into what the controversy was all about, but my question to you is that did the people misread the three language formula which was uh, a part of the draft education policy? Yes. The signals that some of the states where we had a little resentment to this particular policy, probably they did not get the signal that we wanted them to get in the formulation. Okay. And uh, the, the, I think the, the po point was with respect to a near equivalence of that statement with the 1986 and 1992 uh, policy, where Hindi was compulsory to be studied in the southern state. If and the non, uh, there is a part of the non-Hindi speaking uh, formula, and uh, what we did was to bring in a flexibility in that. The rest of the three for in, uh, three uh, uh, language formula we retain, but we introduced this additional flexibility element into the formulation. But all these uh, southern political parties from the southern state, they said that the government made a U-turn and no, they I made see, changes it's, it's at the eleventh hour. It's not at all. I should say. First of all, that they did not get the signal we wanted to get, that it's a flexible policy. And if you had seen the title of that, that particular pa paragraph itself, it was flexible three language formula. So once we realized that there is a scope for it being misunderstood in the context of Hindi imposition, we had an alternate formulation. It's only an alternate formulation. It's not a change in the stance. Uh, that we simply brought in. And this is all the job of the committee and not of anybody else. So it is wrong to say that government came in and they made the changes and they got a change. These kind of things are being uh, said about in the country. I think they are, they are travesty of truth. There is more than what this controversy has, all about, has been, been all about. We speak, speak about the three language formula. But the way linguistic isolation in the country in the past many years has been seen, does this policy really broaden the horizon of uh, the linguistic formula in the country and how languages will be taken up? That is the biggest talking point, I think. I think that's a very pertinent thing, Nilu. I think you have touched the real heart of our language policy. What we have done is to look at in a holistic way the language-related uh, development and its integration into the education. Language, as you know, is a means of communication and also a means of cultural transactions. And that is a fundamental thing. And there is quite a lot of study that has been done with regard to the question of how does a language capability develops in a child from the early years after its birth. And this is an outcome of the research on cognitive sciences and uh, those kind of scientific and neural sciences. And today, those information is available. 
if you take that into account in the formulation and take into account the fact that the ability of the child to learn early in the age in fact he starts picking up the subtle differences between the signs and the form and the noises between different formulations and structures in the language he shows that it can it has an enormous capacity to learn languages between 3 years and 8 years so children will be given the option of learning three languages and if they want to learn more they can they can but then the next question is that what about yes, the sir. training of the teachers the infrastructure how does it follow from here on then i think that is a that is that is another point we have said first of all we have put emphasis on all the languages of india number 1 number 2 we are given flexibility for the choice of education learning uh, choice for the states to decide what to do the third element is the present state with respect to the availability of teachers availability of infrastructure and many other more modern methods of learning languages i think we need to strengthen these systems so there is an elaborate discussion on how do we want to go about developing the language and there are then the questions of classical languages like sanskrit pali tamil malayalam kannada they are all classical languages and they have enormous literature in fact if you look at sanskrit it is a literature which is which contains the classical language sanskrit and is more than what uh, latin and greek put together that is the richness of our language i think these are reflected in the form of how do we can strengthen this heritage and make sure that it gets into the integration in the mode of the education that we are planning and to make sure that we realize it in the context of learning language and also making it a cultural vehicle uh, for people to interact and uh, uh, converse there is other part and but and also as i said language has this enormous capability but if you learn language early in the age between 3 and 8 then this ability it improves the neural functioning of those regions which are related to the language and also the growth of tissues around that they are densified and india is very fortunate that it has a multilingual environment naturally set for you to take advantage of these facts okay uh, putting a uh, a lid on the controversy bit of it now i want to come on to the other aspects of uh, the policy now uh, starting with that how this uh, traditional 10 plus 2 system which has been running for years and years will now be replaced by the k12 format now i just want to understand in short that what is it going to really do to the school education and how is it going to impact the children oh, that that in fact this is some one of the very significant issue that we went into great details several meetings we discussed this question the reason is we have today a much better understanding of the growth and evolution of the brain i may say that 86% of the brain evolves By, by the age of six, so first and foremost is that there are what is called as a developmentally appropriate education, which depending on the brain's ability, you try to provide those kind of education which can be absorbed, and this is not uniform across all the children. So the early phase, which we call the foundational phase of five years, we try to equi- equalize the capabilities of the student by paying special attention. to areas of students development which may not be the same as some of the for example one student will show brilliance in mathematics another student will show brilliance in language study third may do it for science but by the age of 8 this becomes moral and it is able to take up the prescriptive studies mm-hmm. so that is the first part then in the prescriptive studies you try to also look at the cognitive capability and the socio cognitive cognitive or socio emotional aspects of the thing it develops so that is why the three year and three year which is preparatory and middle school we have introduced so this which means can, I'll, I'll, i'm sorry to interrupt you here because i just wanted to clarify so are we to understand that the formal education for a child in india if after this policy is implemented will start from the age of 3 yes and go up to 18 8 by last four years which we call as the secondary after this narration related to foundational uh, preparatory middle stage we go to the uh, secondary secondary the, the child reaches the adolescence the ability to comprehend things we already le- to learn to learn out of books and learn to learn 
and then there are many things in the vocational areas which can be picked up. So you are not only learned further for higher knowledge acquisition, you are also learned enough for pursuing certain types of vocational things if you want to stop at the age of 18. So it provides those two routes very carefully and the important, other important thing I want to emphasize is the fact that this structuring which is developmentally appropriate enables early detection and correction of the developmental issues related to the child which is reflected ultimately in terms of large dropouts. The thing that the present structure of uh, 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 will this is a structured way of acquisition of the knowledge by the child and that's depending the on its development. Standard which is being followed. Uh, yes. It is, it is most important, we have, we have seen that that is one that will be most appropriate in terms of an educational system that will enable less of the problems which are related to dropouts and things like that. So early childhood care and education, the structure of Anganwadis, the type of bringing together the nutrition, health as well as the education and then trying to create a new, these are all the sp specific important elements coming out of this structuring but, of uh, education. But, uh, Professor, I wanted to clarify that, you know, the Anganwadi system, if you look at, they have not paid attention too much on education in the past. They've basically dwelt on the health and uh, the nutrition aspect of it. So when this entire system is, is being restructured, uh, will the Anganwadi system not go through some kind of an upheaval? Uh, what, what our recommendation on this is, we do recognize the, the period in the Anganwadi should have the education nutrition and health as the three and there are three agencies in the government they look after these three so we are respective ministry so they in, in this particular case in order to provide a comprehensive approach uh, to the Anganwadi education we need to bring them together and if there are new Anganwadis to be set up the provision for this kind of a thing need to be introduced the older Anganwadis will be strengthened with respect to the education which is a very critical thing and we can even relook that how do we want to further improve the Anganwadis itself, even this composite role uh, in the future, you bring in more science, more psychology, more architecture and create an environment for a, for a child which is much more conducive and therefore the child comes in, it is, uh, it is, it is yearning to come and uh, study in Anganwadi. That kind of an Im Im environment we need, to, even that we have suggested. Uh, solutions for that. So I think it's a, it's a composite approach of doing this together uh, that's going to make a difference in the early childhood education and its follow-up. Another interesting aspect of this policy is that how the extracurricular activity and the curricular uh, activities will be integrated. They won't be seen as separate. So how does that unfold in terms of if you have to look at a child Say, for example, on a particular day he goes, so he or she goes to school. So how is how is the time going to be divided and how does one look at it? Well, the operational details of how you want to really implement on the ground with respect to the policy is something to be worked out. But what we have tried to do is to reduce the role of rote learning okay. in the overall educational system. We have also done away with the separation between curricular, extracurricular and non-curricular activities. We have also we removed the barrier between science, arts and humanities. We ultimately between the regular education and the vocational education. So there is an overall integration of the education as an integrated knowledge base which you want to hand, hand over to the children. So and this also is coupled with the fact that there will be a tremendous flexibility for the make choices. For example, the student would like to certainly do science and mathematics at a certain stage, but he would like to do arts and crafts and music and those kind of a thing. You need infrastructure for that. So what is so what he or she would have the option in the school itself. In the school itself of several options of several areas mm. which can be brought in. And the examinations could be sortably tailored for those kind of the important thing is for those kind of a thing, if you if you start getting one music teacher in one school, it's not workable. The complex that we are thinking of will contain even if one music teacher, wherever there is a requirement in whichever school, he can he or she can go and do that. Similarly, there is one playground, it can be shared. Similarly, there is a library which is a very versatile library which can be funded, but then most of the schools can make use of it. And many other kind of equipments and other, and then sharing the experiences, reviewing systems, upgrading the methods 
with new methodologies and pedagogy. I think it will be all facilitated by this concept that we have suggested with respect to the comple complexes. And I may not say that this, this, the ownership is not with this committee alone. It was originally suggested by the Kothari committee, but unfortunately, I think its implementation has been not as satisfactory as we would have liked. But uh, in this integrated approach, how is a child going to be assessed when it comes to examination systems? How is the child really going to be assessed? I think we, we have given a very detailed approach to the uh, uh, this thing. The most important thing is the child is assessed with respect to its learning outcomes. And so the, whether the child is able to have an independent thinking, it is able to add, arrive at certain type of views by looking at a certain type of inputs, parameters. So these are all the ability of the brain to take views under a certain set of input parameters. The, the ability to do this is what is built into the educational program for the child. So the child is no longer constrained to learn from books remember the chapters and reproduce it in an examination. That is not the way in nature. And also the examinations will be done to take care of this kind of a outcome that is expected out of it. I think it could be much, the learning will be made into a joyous experience rather than a strenuous and punishing experience. That's what we think in our recommendation. Coming to the higher education now, a lot of changes uh, have been recommended in the higher education. Now, uh, say for example, this the introduction of uh, the four-year graduate program. Now, where does it lead to? Because there are reports that uh, the MPhil would be completely done away with because it is not required if you are doing a complete four-year undergraduate program. You know, the major uh, uh, change that we have recommended in the context of the four-year undergraduate program is the fact that we want to have a foundational liberal education as a common thread that flows. The foundation, the liberal education is nothing but you try to integrate uh, social sciences, humanities, sciences, mathematics, and all these together in the early stage of the undergraduate education. And you give a totally a multidisciplinary uh, the, the educational system which covers a good amount of broad knowledge base. Now, on that, you create the specialization that you want to do in undergraduate. If I want to become a physicist, I'll, I'll take a major in physics. But along with that, I want to learn philosophy, I will take my philosophy as a minor. So with that kind of a flexibility at the next level, we are going to bring in the liberal education as a foundational part of an undergraduate education and improve the ability of the students or the youngsters to comprehend things in a much more broader sense than the limited systems that you can understand today when you take up a commerce degree or a physics degree or a mathematics So, Professor, degree. if I have understood you correctly in what you have just explained, that say, for example, all these, I mean, all, the, all these uh, uh, days, you know, and we've seen that a, maybe a science graduate or someone who's uh, doing a physics major uh, didn't have the option of studying literature at that level. Yes, so, I'm, now you would have the freedom to opt for that combination. Absolutely. Um, you're very right. Uh, that is one aspect. The second aspect is the four-year undergraduate education with uh, liberal education as one, one of the foundational aspect of it is the fact that you can make exit and entry. You can make exit for after the first year if you don't want to continue for any other reason, financial or personal or anything. You can exit but with a uh, certificate. If you want to exit in the second year, you can go with a diploma. If you go for a third year, you go with a degree. And the fourth year, a degree with uh, the research. Uh, it could be even called as an honors degree. So there is an exit and you can also go into at the point at which you left the education. At a late, say five years later, you find now I'm more capable of going for a higher education. He or she can get back into it by fulfilling certain minimal requirements of admission. So this gives you the opportunity to leave or come in when you want. This flexibility is a tremendous flexibility. Many people for reasons beyond their control had to give up education and when they give it up, it's a permanent feature of their life. Yeah. See, so example, that we have avoided it uh, in this particular case by having this pro flexible provision. And so that is the second part. And you said about MPhil. Yes, I was just coming to that, that MPhil was the prerequisite for doing a PhD. So what happens to that if MPhil is completely done away with So that? there are four ways, uh, two or three ways in which 
you can enter into the research program. First of all, the fourth year of the undergraduate also provides you a chance to do start your research as an interest. Once you do that part of it, you can have a one one year. Uh, you you can go directly to PhD. Suppose you are done only up to the third year, then you can take an MPhil for one year and go for a PhD. If you go for a total, you decide to go right in the beginning itself. You can have a five-year kind of a thing because a prerequisite for entering into MPhil or the PhD. So there are many routes in which you can enter the PhD thing uh, through MPhil or directly, depending on how you want to go through the undergraduate program. Uh, the fourth year is important in deciding whether you want to go directly or through a one-year MPhil or with a two-year. That kind of a thing. MPhil is not done away with. Medical education is concerned. There are a lot of structural changes which have been introduced. What about them? Say, for example, lateral entries for nursing and dentistry. See, our idea, as I, I told you, yeah, I, yeah, I will tell you, it's the, the story starts with the fact that our higher educational institutions of the future, we have identified three broad levels at which the higher education system will run. The one which will be called the research universities, which will have a strong teaching component and research part of it. A second level is the teaching universities with a strong research component supporting it. And the third level is the degree giving colleges. These are the three levels. These research universities or the teaching universities are going to have in the future a comprehensive approach to education. So that you will have not only uh, the, the liberal education, not only areas like uh, mainstream, main, uh, mainstream science as we understand today, but also professional education like engineering, medicine, agriculture and many other areas and even vocational. So you, it's going to be integrated. The reason is we see education and throughout this policy as an holistic approach to knowledge uh, thing and we cannot segment it in this kind of a thing and that is why this is there. So what we, what ultimately the medical colleges will be a part of, you look at Stanford University or MIT, they have a medical school, they have a law, law school, they have a, so this is the concept of the research universities. We expect about 100 to 200 research universities in the next uh, but if 15 I was, years. I was looking at the so that is where the medical education's importance comes. When you have this kind of an integration, you learn far more than what you just learn as a dentist or as a uh, nurse Absolutely. besides of course MBBS. And secondly, the present according to the, 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 the doctor, uh, the, the, the eminent scientist come doctor who looked at the medical education, Devi Shetty himself, doctor, he told me that the med present medical practitioners are hardly empowered to do anything which is worth calling it a medical practice. So he needs, he felt that we need to empower them. So there are ways in which we need to empower them. You give them a better educational uh, tool to deal with this, which includes a much more wider knowledge of the medical the thing. And then there are more examples in like in Maharashtra, where they have made sure that the MBBS is certainly something, a degree worth possessing. But uh, Professor, I was, I was reading the statistics that there are some 800 universities in India and some 40,000 colleges and many of them are affiliated, you know. So what happens to these affiliations and uh, is there any plan to bring them under one yes, umbrella? Yes, yes. Actually, we have addressed this question in the context of the future of all these colleges, 40,000 colleges. Our thing is, we want to do it with the affiliation as a concept. So in the future, as we move towards, uh, say, five to ten years, we would like to have not affiliation, but standalone colleges capable of giving degrees. So they will be multidisciplinary, they will have liberal kind of an approach in education, and we have many variety of subjects in which the subject with the student can study, and ultimately the standalone, but at the college level with a graduate, uh, undergraduate degree or things of that kind. So ultimately, this 40,000 and all, some of them, some of them are quite old. It's not right. all the 40,000 is an issue. Some of them which are, have this kind of a thing will give them enough time to become standalone autonomous colleges. The, then the next level, if they, if they really then put more money, more resources, then it can become teaching universities. But the difference is four to 5,000 students is what we can expect in a college. But it will become something like 10 to 20,000 when it go to teaching universities or even research universities in the class of 20, 10 to 20,000 students. Because that is the kind of a number which makes the system, the totality of the system, which you call as a comprehensive knowledge institution, 
makes feasible in terms of optimality. Last two questions, uh, Professor. One is that uh, the entire aim of uh, bringing about such a comprehensive uh, education policy is also to have access, equity and equality. And when you talk about these three aspects in the education system, the first and the foremost question which comes to my mind and I definitely ask you is that what about the fee structure at the school level and also at the higher level? Is it going to be uh, painstakingly huge? No. Like no. for example, we see a, a huge disparity when it comes to government schools and the private schools. You, you can uh, make out the difference between the, the eminent universities and the normal regular universities. So this fee disparity, how will you address this issue? First of all, the education, we, if you see one of the important aspects of the education is whosoever runs the educational institution, it will be a non-profit. That we have very clearly mentioned. So it is not for profit that you run educational institutions in the country. Number two, the government over the years have taken several steps to provide financial support and other kinds of support for those who are underprivileged in the class and the society. That is, we, the policy may even strengthen it further. That is, and it doesn't make a difference between private and public, uh, private funded, not public. Everybody has to conform to that kind of a thing. And there should be enough evidence to show that this is being followed by all the institutions. Third, in the context of uh, the uh, education itself, we want to upgrade the public because government's money goes into the public institution. We want to further improve the public institution's stature in the society. And the society's, the, the stature that they will get is such that you no longer debate whether I should send my student, a youngster to the public school or private school. The question is if you, you may send it to private school simply because he happens to be very near to your place. Otherwise, the considerations with respect to current consideration that private schools are better than public schools, these kind of things have to be dealt with. So over the years, the public schools will be further strengthened in terms of the quality of education, infrastructure, and everything that you would aspire to have in the school. And I'm sure the government will be uh, is quite seized with this kind of an approach in dealing with school education. We think these multiple steps we have taken in the context of schools uh, certainly will go away will go go a long way in trying to address the fundamental issues of schooling and equally importantly as you rightly said for those underprivileged ones the present provisions which are quite good will be further strengthened where it's possible and we have put down some very specific steps on that kind of a thing and whomsoever in the private schools conform to this kind of discipline because it's often going to be a non-profit system I think they will get the support of the government in certain areas. For example, in a complex, there is a playground and the private school does not have any. The government will certainly share it. After all, it's the cost of education and children. So government will certainly share those kind of with a certain nominal uh, support and fees or those kind of a thing. So after, so after listening to Professor Kasturi Rangan for the last almost 27 minutes, I think the education system looks very promising for the next 30 years and it's the best of times to be a student or a teacher in India. I think I'm all right. Thank you, Neil. Yes, you are absolutely right. I only want to say that this is the work of not only my teammates who are most wonderful teammates who work to, we all work together, including people like Manjul Bhagav who was from Princeton. Uh, we also had a very large number of educationists, intellectuals and public figures supporting us by giving their and a set of peer reviewers who really went into the details of the document. And then in 70, 60, 70 institutions which came out with their fantastic inputs on this. So to us, it has been a great experience in terms of getting that kind of a support from the various in location, institutions, individuals and many other aspects which made our task of course uh, certainly more realistic in face of, in the face of a complexity wish you all the best professor kasturi rangan and we look forward to more marvels from you it was a oh, pleasure no. talking to you marvel is when it happens <laughs> it will happen <laughs> thank you thank you so much thank you thank you very so that's much. it on this episode of to the point see you next time with another personality goodbye and thanks for your time